the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. All right, so we're in James chapter 5, and uh, last week we uh, entered into uh, the letter of James by way of introduction, looking at the author and the recipients. And if you recall from last week, we uh, looked at some, some data that I think suggests James was viewed as really the key leader of Christianity in its opening decades. That is to say, if you were to ask anyone in the early church, including Peter and Paul and John, who is the unrivaled leader of this movement of Christianity, they would probably say James. And we saw that by virtue of the fact that at least on three significant occasions, Paul defers to James, and James uh, essentially in Acts 15 makes the decision for the council about how to include Gentiles into the body of Christ. So James is clearly functioning as a key leader and probably would be viewed as the head of the worldwide movement of Christianity, including the fact that Josephus, the early Jewish historian, only mentions James in connection with Christianity, none of the other apostles. So this morning we're building on that to look at part two of our introduction. That is to say, uh, in light of who James is and who he's writing to, and I argued that this, this epistle is written to Jewish believers of the diaspora, that is the dispersion of the Jewish people, probably east of Jerusalem, going all the way to Elam and Babylonia, where there were still Jewish populations uh, in light of the Babylonian captivity, which happened in 586 BC with the destruction of the temple. So uh, James is writing to those particular believers and uh, Today we're going to look at why he's writing, when he's writing, and some of the key features of the theme of James. But I wanted to frame this by reading uh, chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Uh, I think this is a good passage for encapsulating the themes that are very important in James. He says this, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In this passage, James is focusing on uh, the imminence of the Lord's return. And although some would suggest uh, James's Christology is rather simple as compared with Paul, and we probably could make that argument, at the same time he uh, unceasingly stresses the lordship of Christ. Christ is the Lord, and he is about to return. And in light of that, there is a sense of urgency for our ethical response to Jesus' imminent return. That is to say, if you were to boil down some of the main messages in the epistle of James, it's this, in light of this urgency, because of Christ's coming, we need to live out our faith in a way that shows we truly believe in Jesus as the Messiah. We're not to be playing games, so to speak, with our Christian confession. We're to be showing it through our deeds of mercy, compassion, and kindness to those around us. All right, so let's look here at some of the more detailed uh, Introduction, introductory matters that might help us to understand how James is framed. All right, I have there a section called Origin. Origin, where did this epistle get written? Uh, most would argue that probably James, the head of the Jerusalem church, did not really leave Jerusalem between the years AD 44 until his martyrdom in AD 62. So in light of that, it's likely that in that entire span of time, those two decades, he's really faithfully laboring in the Jerusalem church. So he has a unique opportunity because uh, in the early stages of the gospel, uh, Christianity was really seen as a sect within Judaism. That is a minority sect within Judaism. It only after some period of time had passed and Paul had begun to do his mission to the Gentiles 
did Christianity get imperial persecution from the Roman state. So early on, they're still viewed as essentially a Jewish sect. And so within that, James is in a unique place in Jerusalem because it's really viewed as the center of this Christian movement. So it's likely that he writes from Jerusalem and he's writing to uh, Jewish believers outside of Jerusalem. And I point out here a few things that have been mentioned as indications that James is likely writing from Jerusalem. So you can look through those. These are uh, some, some keys that would just help us to see that. Number one, he mentions early and latter or late rains, which uh, is in the passage that I just read. And this is a uh, typical climate and meteorological pattern of Judea, that there's an early rainy season and a late rainy season. Uh, this is typical of uh, some desert climates uh, like Judea tends to be, uh, or if you've lived out in California, there's a similar climate in Southern California. Uh, number two, there's a reference to the scorching east wind from the desert. Again, this would be a phenomenon that would be common in Jerusalem if you're on the, the outskirts of, of the desert. Uh, if you've ever lived in, in California, again, you, you can probably understand this. I just remember we would drive through a little town called Mojave quite a bit, and the wind was just incessant, incessant wind. Uh, in fact, some days I, we, were in, uh, when we were moving across the, the country to come here to Virginia Beach, uh, we stopped in a little town called Baker, not Bakersfield, but Baker. And it's in the desert, and it literally, when you got out of the car, it felt like a giant hair dryer was blowing on you. <laughs> so if you've ever been in a climate like that, you can understand. And, and so Jerusalem uh, would also understand what this was like. There's also allusion to fresh and saltwater springs, and this is consistent with water sources near the Dead Sea. So again, we know that the Dead Sea is uh, an extremely salty body of water such that you float automatically in the water because of the saline content being so high. When I was in the Dead Sea, I made the mistake of tasting the water. And I, I'll never do that again, but it, it burned. Uh, you can take my word for it, it burns. So at any rate, uh, James uses that as an illustration. Are you fresh water? Are you salt water? Don't mix the two. And he relates this to how we speak to our tongues. And then number four, there's a depiction of hell as Gehenna. The only other place that this is done is in Jesus' teaching. And it's also another name for the Valley of Hinnom, which is directly south of the Temple Mount. And so, uh, again, James seems to be using a geographical geograph term from the environment of Jerusalem. All right, so if, if the origin is from Jerusalem, as we think it is, what's the occasion? Why is James writing? If this is the first New Testament book, what precipitated James writing it? Why would he do this? What's going on? Well, it's probably best to see this book, as I note here, as a proto-encyclical letter. Now, that's uh, a phrase that I made up to try to capture the fact that encyclical letters as we know them didn't really exist. There wasn't, say, a Roman Catholic church publishing an encyclical letter, or uh, in the early church history, there were often letters that would be circulated at certain times from significant bishops in the church. Uh, it's not certain that that sort of phenomenon was happening, although there are other examples of prominent Pharisees from Jerusalem writing letters to Jews that are spread throughout the world. Uh, and particularly, these would often come from Jerusalem because it was seen as the epicenter. If you're a Jewish person living, say, in Babylon, you're going to come to Jerusalem during the significant religious festivals, and so everyone in Jerusalem is kind of seen as the official standard uh, and noteworthy leaders in your particular religious movement. So a, a letter such as this from James would have great standing among Christian believers outside of Jerusalem living in these enclaves throughout the eastern fringes of the Roman Empire. And uh, so James writes to encourage them, and I think specifically to admonish them to live out consistently their Christian faith. Now this is where James often is compared to Paul, and so we often think James is the problem child of the New Testament, right? We talked about this a little bit last week, that we have to try to square James with Paul because Paul has a very clear understanding of justification by faith, and James seems to be a little bit too eager to include works into the formula, right? To the point that uh, Martin Luther called James an epistle of straw. Well, is that really the case? I think we have to understand if James is early, in fact, if James is the first written book of the New Testament, it's actually the other way around. James is saying, you say you believe in Jesus as Messiah, does your life back that confession up? 
Are you really living out a Christian life? This isn't just an add-on that you can still be a faithful Jew and just add a little bit of Jesus to your Judaism. James is saying, no, your life needs to be transformed. It's a practical wisdom book for how to live out an ethical life of righteousness, having confessed Jesus as Messiah. All right, so he wants them to live this out. This is why the book is heavy on ethics, right? There's a lot of practical stuff about behavior. It's heavy on wisdom. Uh, many call James the Proverbs of the New Testament, although he doesn't really allude a lot to Proverbs. He only quotes Proverbs once in the book. He is in a very staccato wisdom style with a lot of aphorisms, a lot of proverbial type of sayings. And so he's using wisdom as Jesus did. Right? Jesus was really the greatest wisdom teacher. And uh, I, I say this a lot in my seminary classes, that we need to think of Jesus as a sage who's using wisdom to teach. If you look at how he teaches, he uses formulae from the wisdom corpus in his teaching, even in his parables. All right, so one of the things that took place around this time is there was a severe famine in AD 46. It's alluded to in the book of Acts. It uh, doesn't get a lot of description there, but we know that this took place. We also know that there was a lot of uh, difficulty with Jewish people who were being oppressed by their landlords. James talks a lot about ruthless Jewish landlords. So it's likely that somehow between uh, AD 46 with the famine and his eventual death and the destruction of Jerusalem, which would be AD 62 when he died, AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the temple again, that James has written this letter. It would seem to be early, and it would seem to probably be before the Jerusalem Council. So all that helps us to really uh, pin a date somewhere between 46 and 48, as I'll talk about in a moment. One other thing that seems to substan substantiate the encyclical nature of this letter, why we think it's uh, a circular letter of sorts, is that James is not really dealing with any specific community. Okay, so we see this in his letter, you could really read through James and apply it in almost any situation, any church, anywhere. When we read Paul's letters, on the other hand, we know that he often makes very personal appeals, doesn't he? For instance, uh, it's not uncommon for Paul at the end of an epistle to say, uh, I beseech Iodius and Syntyche that they agree in the Lord. Or addressing believers by name as he does in the epistle to the Romans, even though he hasn't been there, he knows many of the believers, and Paul would often do this. James, on the other hand, is addressing very typical and hypothetical situations that really would fit in any sort of scenario. So I give you some examples there. He talks about trials of any kind, not specific trials, or trials of any kind. All of us can kind of fit our lives probably into that statement, right? We all have trials. If he specified it, maybe we could think we are exempt somehow, but if it's trials of any kind, we all experience trials of some sort or another. So he talks generically about that. Uh, he often appeals to hypothetical or envisaged, envisaged situations rather than actual ones, such as chapter 2, if a rich man enters, a hypothetical scenario. He uses imaginary rhetorical opponents. Someone might say this, but I say this. And so he's answering hypothetical questions in a dialogue dispute format. Uh, he appeals to typical issues such as interpersonal conflict. You know, what church doesn't have some sort of conflict from time to time, right? We, we bring in our own sin natures with us. If there were a perfect church, as soon as we joined it, it would no longer be perfect, right? So we know that things like this happen in a, a body of redeemed believers. So uh, we can apply that in various situations. And then, again, there's no uh, personal request made of the reader. We don't get to the end and, and have somebody asked, uh, get asked to bring books or various things that Paul would often do. All right, so this is more of a generic letter along the same lines that, for example, Ephesians would be in the Pauline corpus. So this is probably an encyclical letter for various believers in various locations. Okay, let's talk about the date. All right, when did this take place? Uh, we know James was martyred in AD 62. We can fix that date through Josephus and through some other things. And so we know it was before that, some place it closer to that, but if, if, it, if he writes it close to his death, it's curious he wouldn't include anything about Paul or the Gentile mission or maybe use the word saints or Christians. He doesn't use those terms, so that suggests it's early. 
Along with that, I have, I think here, six other arguments that suggest this is very early. Last week we looked at Acts 15, and we saw that there are about a dozen similarities between Acts 15, what James says there, and the letter of James. This suggests around the same time, perhaps, James is writing both the letter that Paul and his associates take to the churches, as well as the letter of James to Jewish believers. Perhaps uh, slightly before the Jerusalem Council, he writes this letter. All right, he has an abundant usage of Jesus sayings which suggest a date prior to the writing of the canonical gospels. Why do we say that? Because it's more likely if the canonical gospels had been written, the synoptic gospels in particular, that James might have alluded to it more frequently than he does. Instead, he just seems to assume some knowledge of Jesus' teaching. Uh, it's often said that James is the most Jesus-soaked writing of the New Testament, and that's true. He has completely absorbed and imbibed Jesus' teaching. In fact, if you turn your handout over, uh, I have in the second to last category there on style, uh, we'll talk about commonalities between James and Jesus, in particular the Sermon on the Mount. Everything in pink there is something Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that James replicates in his own epistle. So he's uh, thoroughly soaked the teaching of Jesus and he uses it, but he also uses it somewhat loosely. He doesn't necessarily say, thus says the scriptures or something along that line of a citation formula. Rather, he's just uh, appealing to the same way of thinking and speaking. All right, number three, the relative simplicity of the letter's Christology. All right, what do I mean by this? If you look at, say, Philippians 2, if you look at the epistle to the Colossians, if you look at Ephesians, uh, you'll find Paul at his peak in terms of describing Christology, that is the doctrine of Christ. When he talks about uh, the kenosis, Jesus uh, making himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, becoming obedient to the point of death, he's really developing this idea of Christology, the doctrine of Christ. In fact, this is, for theologians, probably I would say the most difficult doctrine to grapple with because there are very few doctrines where you walk such a razor's edge. If you go into one side or the other, you're, you're falling into heresy. And so very church, uh, church councils throughout the ages have had to very finely de define the terms and understand who Christ is as fully man and fully God. Uh, how does that work? Uh, do his natures overlap? Is he fully this and fully that? And so uh, as you work through Christology, it's, it's a difficult uh, doctrine to really nail, but it's, a, it's an incredibly important one. James, on the other hand, uh, he's not thinking in terms of high Christology so much as Jesus is sovereign, therefore you must obey him. If he's your Lord, if you've placed your faith in him, your life needs to be radically different, and so you need to acknowledge him as Lord. All right, number four, he doesn't reference any persecution. He doesn't use the word Christians. He doesn't use the word saints. Paul does this all the time. And so this suggests that it's still early on. It wasn't until later uh, that Christianity was persecuted on, as official imperial policy. All right, so that suggests an early date. Uh, he talks about ruthless Jewish landlords, as I said, and he does not talk about the Gentile mission uh, so this seems to suggest it's before the peak of Paul's ministry, which we would probably date from AD 48 onward. Okay? All right, so with all those uh, thoughts in mind, we have here an epistle perhaps occasioned by the famine in AD 46. In any event, probably between 46 and 48, where the Jerusalem Council is taking place, 48 to 49 in that time frame. Okay, so James is the first writing. It's before that. He's writing to Jewish Christians who are dispersed. All right, let's talk about his literary structure. Uh, the fourth category there, literary structure. Uh, this has been a difficult one over the years. Uh, many have argued that James has no structure. It's just a haphazard uh, collection of sayings. Luther, in particular, who took a low view of James pretty much all across the board, uh, failed to see any discernible structure in James. And it has been a, a difficulty. Uh, not so much, I would say, as some books. Uh, I had to work on, I think I've mentioned this class before, uh, the structure of Ecclesiastes uh, over the summer, writing part of an introduction to a commentary. And there was one scholar who actually argued that the book of Ecclesiastes was in a folio that someone dropped and just threw the pages back together. That's how haphazard he, he thought it was, which is kind of silly, but it does illustrate uh, the idea that some people come to these books and they just cannot figure out, is there a discernible arrangement or organization to his thought, or is it just a random rambling of a really enthusiastic preacher? 
Well, I would say that there is a structure, and I think William Varner in his commentary has uh, what I think is closest to probably being right on in terms of this. So look at this uh, chart here at the bottom of the page. Uh, in the right column, we have what James, uh, not James Varner, although he's <laughs> ordained and the Lord bless him, William Varner, <laughs> William Varner, uh, he says the nominative of address. What do we mean by that? Uh, James likes to appeal to his listeners by use of the term brothers. He says, my brothers, or uh, all of you, in these various ways. And he does this so frequently, it's really become a structural device for the book. So if we look through this, on the right-hand column, every section where he's beginning a new appeal really helps us to see that's probably a new section in the epistle. So we could kind of go through that and uh, see how often he says, my brothers or my beloved brothers among you. If you flip the page, uh, he has again, brothers, you who say, you rich brothers, my brothers and my brothers. Okay, so James is here uh, really emphasizing the fraternity of the believers, probably even more so because these are Jewish Christians. So there's an ethnic tie as well as a spiritual tie. So he's saying, my brothers, my beloved brothers. Now, in every case, when he does that, he follows it either with a command or a rhetorical question. And he likes to use this uh, predominantly imperatives. It's said that uh, James has imperatives in, I think, 59 out of the 89 verses or something like that. So he's a heavy imperative uh, way of exhorting. So in the right-hand column, you'll see that in each case, there's either a command or a question to really get them to think about their heart. Now, why have I uh, put the middle here in, in a shaded color? Let me try to explain that. Uh, there are, if you follow this structure, 14 sections in the epistle to James, of James. 14 sections. The 7th and the 8th are probably the peak of the book. So the first one is uh, what Varner calls the thematic peak, and that is the theme of wisdom. In James 3, 13 to 18, he talks about wisdom which is from above. I'll make the case in a moment that whenever James talks about wisdom, he's, I think, also talking about the spirit because the spirit is associated with wisdom. Isaiah 11.2 says the spirit of wisdom. So James doesn't have a fully developed doctrine of the Holy Spirit either, but he does talk a lot about, in several cases, about wisdom. And so wisdom seems to be tied to the spirit. If we are full of the spirit, we're full of wisdom. If you want to do an interesting study sometime, do, do a comparison of where the spirit is and where wisdom is talked about. Very interesting. Going back to the Old Testament, to the uh, elders, the 70 elders that uh, Moses chose to Acts 6, uh, wherever the spirit is at work, there is wisdom also. So here he says, you need to be wise and understanding. You need wisdom from above. The second half of that in 4, 1 to 10 begins with a rhetorical question, what causes quarrels? And here his admonition is to become God's friend. There's a lot of uh, talk and, and debate about how James uses Abraham versus how Paul uses Abraham. If you've ever uh, read through these books, if you read through Romans and you see how Paul very intricately and carefully argues a theological point from the fact that Abraham believed before he was circumcised, do you remember that? So uh, Paul extrapolates from that that justification occurs by faith rather than the works of the law. James, on the other hand, when he mentions Abraham, he says that Abraham showed his works showed his faith, rather, by his works, that is to say, what he did. So both Paul and James are using Abraham, but for different reasons. Paul's using Abraham to make a theological point that Abraham believed for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6, before he was circumcised. James is using Abraham to say Abraham was a friend of God because he didn't just have lip service faith, he had obedient faith. You remember what God says to Abraham after the binding of Isaac, what the Jewish people call the Akedah? This is, he says, now I know that you have a heart that will obey, that you've been obedient. So for in, in James's case, he's using Abraham as an example. If your faith is real, it will affect how you live. And Abraham, Genesis 26, 15 tells us, obeyed the Torah, even before he had Torah. 
He obeyed God's precepts. So James uses him in that sense, and Abraham is called the friend of God. We too should be God's friend if we're doing righteousness. So Abraham is an example to us in that sense. All right, and then he works through uh, the rest of the sections uh, down through the end, and I'll just uh, leave a, a bit of a hanging curveball here, but let me just mention this. Uh, many people get vexed over how do we reconcile Paul and James when it comes to the doctrine of justification by faith, and that is a serious debate that we have to think through carefully, but others have mentioned a more pressing debate or one that's even more difficult is to understand Paul's use of the law and James's use of the law. When Paul uses the law, it's almost universally to denounce it, for by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. That is, we can't obey the law to get right with God. James, on the other hand, seems to have a very high and benign view of the law. He calls it the perfect law of liberty, the royal law. So James has a high view of the law. So how do we reconcile James and Paul? Again, James, it seems, writing from a Jewish context, is focusing not on the works of the law that Paul did, such as circumcision and those Jewish uh, identifying markers that made them Jewish. That is to say, circumcision, the ceremonial things. James never talks about ceremonial provisions of the law. If you notice this, he's focused on deeds of mercy and kindness. So it would seem that in James's mind, and I'll just throw this out, he takes the teaching of Jesus as the reality of Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah 31 says, the law will be written on your hearts. And so James seems to say, Jesus' Torah is an extension of Old Testament Torah. And so now if we're going to obey, we don't necessarily have to get rid of the law. In fact, the opposite, we need to obey the law as it was originally intended. That is to say, we need to live as Jesus did because he fulfilled the law. Now, is Paul making the opposite requirement? No. Paul is simply saying that Gentiles who come into the body of Christ don't have to become Jewish to be right with God. And that's an important point of the gospel, of course, in the New Testament age. James, on the other hand, is saying uh, the, the morality, the righteousness of the law was embodied in Jesus Christ. And if we live for Jesus and in Jesus as his disciples, we need to be living in such a way that we're fulfilling that, if that makes sense. We're living righteously. All right, questions on anything so far or disagreements? I've been talking a lot. Phil? So, um, like, I think also, like, Paul, like, you know, like in Romans, you know, 13 and 14 and stuff, like, you know, he makes an appeal to the law as well, saying, hey, you know, you know, to fulfill the law by love, you know, he says, hey, the only way you can do this, you know, uh, is through love. And he specifically mentions, you know, you know, don't commit adultery and don't do this. So, I mean, I think I think sometimes, like, Paul is actually in line with James a lot more than what people think. Yeah. And then he also talks about, you know, that we don't nullify the law, but we establish the law. Right. You know, uh, mm -hmm. um, right. and then Christ being, of course, the goal of the law and everything. Right. And then us being in Christ. And, I don't know. <coughs> Anyways, but, I mean, I mean that, that would, that's something I've, I've at least noticed, like, in different reading and stuff, I was like, oh, wow. But, like, Paul really seems to be more in line with James than a lot of people give him credit for. Yeah, so. yeah, I would, I would say that's a fair statement. Uh, Paul says the law is good. Uh, he, he, he doesn't denigrate the law per se, but those who would use the law in illicit ways to justify themselves. Uh, Second Temple Judaism, you know, if you read a lot about this, uh, it's a complicated thing that a lot of scholars have written about, but the basic idea that there was this idea that the law kept you in, so to speak, in the community. And so um, Paul seems to be addressing the fact that no one gets right with God simply by purity to the law, although in and of itself the law is not bad. It's necessary, and so it's a necessary foil for the gospel. So, all right, good, good comment. Anybody else? Terry? <coughs> knowledge in itself can puff people up. And if you get puffed up with knowledge in your Christian community to where you think you're a judge over another, then that kind of is decimating the love aspect 
and love will will do as James says, you will have mercy and kindness and learn to accept others in their failure. So there's a there's a balance that you have to maintain, but <coughs> loving people is primary. Right. Right, as Paul says, uh, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. That's a good way to translate that. So, uh, yeah, it, it edifies. So James, James is convicting in that sense because he doesn't, there's no gray area, so to speak. It, it's, if you're truly a Christian, your life needs to show it. So it's hard to read James and, and feel okay about yourself in a certain sense uh, because, you know, do I measure up to this? In fact, there's one commentator who makes this point that the point of the first four chapters of James is to prove that you can't do this. You can't live up to this standard. Just like if we hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we think, there's no way I can do that. Like, to be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, Matthew 5, 48, how can I do that? So the answer is in James 4, where he says, God gives more grace. And so that's the gospel of James, some would say. And, and I'll try to make that point eventually, I think, when we get there. Okay, so, so James is focusing on deeds of mercy and making sure that our life reflects our true Christianity, our true con uh, confession of faith. All right, so let's end here in the last few minutes just talking about the last two points, style and theology. All right, what's the style of James? Uh, this is my own definition, but I would say it's a hortatory letter. Okay, there's your $50 word for the week. <laughs> Hortatory. What do I mean by that? It's an exhortational letter. It exhorts or admonishes believers. Okay, when we read through James, we get a lot of imperatives. We get a lot of what are you doing sort of questions. You need to do this. So it's, it's very, you know, direct, so to speak. He doesn't beat around the bush. And he draws largely from Jesus' teaching. I have a quote from Richard Bauckham at the front of this. Uh, handout where he says more than any other New Testament writer James is a teacher in the style of Jesus a creative exponent of the wisdom of Jesus a disciple who having been fully trained in his teachers wisdom has become himself a teacher of wisdom like his teacher and I think that's true so he's drawing from Jesus teaching within a wisdom framework and his goal is addressing the ethical behavior of Jewish Christian readers Okay, he doesn't soar to the lofty heights of some of the more sophisticated theological discourse that we find in the New Testament. But at the same time, he's down in the trenches saying, what are you doing about your faith? Are you actively practicing it? James is a lively, energetic, active sort of book. So if, if you tend more towards activism and those sorts of things, James is your guy. Right? This book is going to be a motivation for you to do that, to be active in your world uh, showing mercy and kindness. All right, well, within this stylistic category, I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of how similar James is to Jesus. He seems to replicate many of his same themes and topics, and so I won't read through that, but you can see in every chapter, James has something that reflects the teaching of Jesus. So James is, is sort of as the brother of Jesus, continuing his teaching, his style. And uh, so it's helpful to understand that. And last week we saw, what's interesting I think is, of course we know between the beginning of Jesus' ministry and his death, his brothers are not believers, right? They oppose him. They try to come and do an intervention and take him home and, and stop this folly. But somehow by the time we get to Acts 1.13, they're with the disciples. And they're praying in the upper room. James, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, we learn, had a private visitation from Jesus after the resurrection. So all this happens to James to set him up for leadership within the Jerusalem church. So the question that comes to my mind is, how does James know so much about Jesus' teaching? I don't know if you've thought about that, but I've thought if, if James is not a believer during Jesus' ministry... How is it that he knows so much of Jesus' teaching? He's not reading Matthew, right? Because Matthew hasn't been written yet. It's possible there are other uh, documents that were in, in that were extant in that day that had the sayings of Jesus. There's some debate about that. But where did James get this? I, I would suggest that even though James is not a believer, he's probably there for a lot of Jesus' teaching ministry. How else would they know? 
that he had gone crazy. As they say in Mark 6, he's out of his mind, he's lost it. I would venture to say that James was probably there, perhaps even for the Sermon on the Mount. And so even though James is not a believer, he's listening and soaking it in. What does this do for us? For me, it gives me hope that when we continue to give the word, the word will not come back to us or to the Lord in vain, right? Isaiah 55. So God was preparing him for leadership even though he wasn't a believer at the time. Much like we saw in this video earlier, that the word has effect, even if we think it doesn't. The word can simultaneously judge or save, and sometimes uh, it may seem that it's judging, but in the end it will save. And so uh, we have to be faithful. So James probably hears Jesus on several occasions, and once the lights come on, he's ready to go. He's been trained and, and he's thought through some of these things. And so he is, he's uh, imbibed the teaching of Jesus, his brother. All right, theology. I'll end here. Our time's almost gone. Let me just mention a few points. Uh, James has uh, strong doctrine in the following areas in particular. Number one, God. Uh, he's a monotheist. God is one. He mentioned several times. God is righteous. God is sovereign. God is active in his creation. And this kind of mirrors what God experienced what James expects of his listeners. That is that they're to acknowledge the righteousness of God, the sovereignty of God, and they're to be active in doing and replicating deeds of mercy as God himself does. So if God is active in the world, we too should be active in the world is the idea. All right, what about Jesus the Messiah? He only mentions Jesus twice, but in both cases he underscores his messianic person and his function. Uh, elsewhere he talks about the Lord to be patient for the coming of the Lord, the mercy and compassion of the Lord, the name of the Lord. So he's here referencing uh, Jesus' messianic status. All right, what about the Holy Spirit? We never find the Spirit directly mentioned. It's possible uh, in uh, chapter, uh, one of these chapters, is it two or three, where he talks about the spirit that is in you lusteth to envy, as the King James says. It's perhaps a reference to the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that later. But where he does seem to mention the Spirit is his association with wisdom. This is a key theme in the book. Wisdom is a gift in chapter 1, and many have drawn comparisons to how Paul talks about the Spirit as a gift, particularly if you look at 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, I could add Romans 8, Ephesians 1, other places as well. Uh, this wisdom comes from above, like the Spirit, and it accompanies grace to the humble, where uh, James quotes from Proverbs 3, uh, probably an allusion to wisdom there. All right, also faith. Faith is integral in James. We shouldn't think that James isn't about faith. That's not true. James is about faith. It's just, it's an active faith. Uh, you know, some have said, uh, well, Soren Kierkegaard, if, if you know the existential Danish philosopher, he said this, that, uh, when James says faith without works is dead, we could also turn it around that works without faith is dead, right? In both cases, it's faith that displays a changed life. It's not that, that works justify us, okay? It's, it's not that our faith is just an empty confession. We have to have an active faith that shows the result of a true conversion. All right, so faith is very important in James. And then finally, last things or eschatology. When James gives his ethics, he's also doing this, he's often doing this because the Lord's about to return. And this is a point of motivation for him. If the Lord is coming back, be righteous and be ready to get a proper reward. Believers are living in the last days, according to James, and they've been brought forth to inherit the kingdom. Okay, so we're living in the last days, and we are those who have been the first fruits of believers who will inherit the kingdom. And I would say even now, are living in, in what theologians call inaugurated eschatology, meaning uh, the, the last days have dawned upon us, and we are now getting a foretaste of the coming king, kingdom through our faith in Christ. And so we serve a, a risen Lord who is reigning at the right hand of the Father on high. And I, I would add to that that we, of course, understand he will return visibly and physically one day to the earth to set up a kingdom of a thousand years, as Revelation tells us. And we will be part of that, so the Lord's preparing a people uh, for that. And so, but even now, we're, we're in a foreshadowing of that within the kingdom of Christ. I don't have time to develop that, but I could teach probably 10 lessons just on the kingdom. All right, but uh, for James's purposes, it's uh, focus on last things. All right, any final thoughts or questions or anything? Okay, this has been a 
birdshot, I guess, of uh, concentrated stuff, but hopefully it uh, is helpful. So next week, Lord willing, we'll dive into the opening part of James and we'll, we'll begin to work our way through the epistle and we'll follow this outline uh, of the various sections. All right, so let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, this morning. We thank you for your kindness and goodness to us. As we were reminded even this morning, we are all to be thankful that the gospel has freed us from sin. I thank you, Lord, that you have loved us and that you've revealed yourself through the word. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would have lives that are changed and lives that showcase the fact that our faith is active. It's not a, a dead confession, but it's a true faith that turns us from spiritual death to spiritual life. And as renewed people, we are now actively pursuing a life of righteousness. So I pray that would be the case for all of us here. I pray that we would acknowledge and serve our Lord Jesus faithfully, even in this coming week. We thank you for this opportunity for fellowship today. And I just pray for your blessing on everyone here as we go forward from this place. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.